Welcome to NOAA Live. My name is Grace Simpkins, and I'm going to be moderating today's webinar. This series is sponsored by NOAA's Regional Collaboration Network, which is spread across the country and helps connect people to all that NOAA does. It's also sponsored by Woods Hole Sea Grant, where I work, located at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. And to find out about future webinars, please visit our Woods Hole Sea Grant Education website or simply follow us on Facebook. This is, believe it or not, our 13th webinar in a series designed to help you get to know NOAA and some of our incredible experts during these weeks of school closures. All of our speakers work for some part of NOAA, and if you've been on before, you might remember that stands for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Today I'll be introducing you to Sarah ba Bailey. She is amazing, and she's going to tell you all about Atlantic salmon. We'll be talking about how NOAA does research and manages resources along the coastline and in the ocean, and we want to recognize that there are the traditional these are the traditional territories of the regional native groups who have substantial traditional and local knowledge and much to share with us. So the groups in Maine, where Sarah is from, and please excuse my pronunciation if I mispronounce anything, I've been practicing. So these are the Holton Band of Maliseet Indians, the Arustic Band of Micmacs, the Passamaquoddy Tribe at Indian Township, Passamaquoddy Tribe at Pleasant Point, and the Penobscot Indian Nation. We'd also like to acknowledge that we are hosting this webinar from the land of the Mashpee Wampanoag Tribe and the Wampanoag Tribe of Gayhead Aquina. A few guidelines before I hand it over to Sarah. You're all muted because we have a lot of people on the line. We want to make sure that everybody can hear us. However, we do want your questions. So you'll notice that there's that question box that you may have written where you're from. We encourage you to ask questions. I'll be keeping track of them for Sarah, and she will answer as many of them as she can as we go along. We won't get to all of the questions, but we do try to answer as many as we can. So without further ado, I don't want to keep talking. I'm going to hand it over to Sarah. Here she is. Uh, hi, everybody. Thank you guys for tuning in. I know that some of you guys are on school break right now, which means that you can step away from your computer for a little bit. So if you're tuning in and joining us today, thank you. I'm really glad to have you. Uh, like Grace said, I work for um, Protected Resources up in Orno, Maine, which I'll show you on a map in just a bit. Uh, but I can't wait to talk to you guys about one of my favorite animals today. So let's get started. So when I'm not uh, working from home in the springtime, you can find me on the banks of rivers up in Maine. Uh, I work up in Orno, Maine for the Protected Resources Division within NOAA Fisheries. And in the Protected Resources Division, we work with a species of animal called a diadromous fish. So I'm part of the diadromous fish group. And on the count of three, I want us to all say that big sciencey word together. One, two, three, diadromous. Great, you guys are all now junior scientists in training. Uh, it's a really big scientific -y word, and what that means is it uh, is a type of fish that spends half of its life in fresh water and half of its life in salt water. So that big word diadromous, another uh, term for it is sea run fish. And that's the group of fish that we're gonna be talking about today is those diadromous fish. So I'm hoping that some of you guys might be this age, but that is me in both pictures. Um, as a kid, I grew up in Massachusetts and I spent all of my free time in my backyard, uh, fishing as much as I possibly could. I really liked to be able to fish and net and turn over rocks to study the things that you couldn't see right off the bat. I liked that you had to search for it. So rivers and streams and oceans have always been some of my favorite habitats. Um, so over the years, I spent a lot of time studying all these different habitats. I went to school in Florida so I could study some coral reefs, some mangroves, a lot of different ecosystems. I lived out in California for a bit and studied kelp forests, and I wanted to know how the ocean systems work there. Um, and then finally, I decided that I would go back to school, and there were so many things about the ocean and the rivers that I loved. I couldn't pick just one, so I decided that I was going to study conservation and policy, which brings me to where I am now. So although it doesn't look like it just yet, um, it's still a little cold. Some of you guys may or may not know, we did get snow last week. Uh, yes, it does snow in Maine in April. 
Um, but this is probably how it's going to look in the next month. And the month of May is when things really start to come alive in Maine's rivers and streams. So I keep saying Maine, 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 Maine. Where is Maine? Um, so that star way up north, that is where I live. So that is Forno, Maine. And if you look at the blow up image over on the right hand side of your screen, all of those red dots are our other science centers in the region. So the other centers that are in the Northeast region of the United States. And if you look at that very top red dot, that Orno Field Station, that's where I am. So I know a lot of you guys might be wondering why all of the other red dots are on the ocean. Isn't what our organization does study the ocean? Remember that really cool sciencey term that we learned a couple slides back that we're diadromous? So that word diadromous meant that half the time that fish is in the ocean, but half that time the fish is in fresh water and our freshwater rivers and streams. So our office is actually located on the Penobscot liver, River, which is one of the last strongholds for one of my favorite resources that we're gonna talk about today. And the reason why we're up here studying this is because we're studying something called an endangered species. Does anybody know what an endangered species is? Okay, great question, Sarah. So she's looking to see what is an endangered species. So if you have an answer to that question, please go ahead and write it in your um, box. I see that Rebecca says that means they're not common. Duncan thinks that means that they're close to extinction. Rebecca agrees there's not many. Taylor agrees that that means they're close to extinction. Uh, Ellie thinks maybe it's a species that is threatened by humans or in nature. And Juan thinks that it's a species that is maybe dying out or near extinction. So that seems to be, seems to be, oh, and Chris thinks that maybe they're in danger. So something is dangerous for them. Same, James thinks the same thing. I'll stop now. There's so many great responses. Good job. And all of those sponsor, or all of those responses are uh, exactly right. So an endangered species is something that there's not very many of left. So what my office does is we study the endangered species. We use something called the Endangered Species Act. Uh, it was put in place in 1973 before I was born and I'm sure before a lot of you guys that are tuning in were born. And it um, allows us to focus on species that if we don't do something immediately, we might lose them in our lifetime. So an endangered species is something that's um, you know, we're at risk of losing. Um, and the next step, and I think one of you guys might have said that, if we don't do something, those species become extinct. So extinct means there will be none left. Um, so within NOAA, we focus on about 165 of these species, but we're gonna talk about one in specific today. And that is this guy who is one of my absolute favorites, and it is an Atlantic salmon. So not only are they endangered, but they are what we call critically endangered. A critically endangered species is if we didn't do anything, if we didn't act within the next 10 years, we would run a risk of losing them completely. So there might not be any of these guys left. So this is what I'm gonna to talk to you guys a little bit about today. Um, but before I get into what an Atlantic salmon is, do we have any questions? All right, thank you for asking that. So Ellen would like to know what your favorite fish is. I love Atlantic salmon, um, but if we were talking about outside of the Atlantic salmon, I really like something called a mola mola or an ocean sunfish. It's our biggest member of our bony fish group. Um, they're really, really cool if you ever get a chance to see them, and they have a really wide range. So whether you're off the coast of Woods Hole in Massachusetts or off the coast of California, uh, you still have an opportunity to try to see them. So they're really cool ones. Great. We have another question. So. Um, Duncan is wondering, how do we find out if a species is close to extinction? Ooh, that is a really good question. So we do a lot of research and monitoring projects because we need to try to figure out how many there are. Um, and a lot of that is um, something I'm gonna be getting to a little bit later, but it's looking at historical values, values that we knew of how many were returning in the past versus how many are present today. So a lot of it is examining what numbers we've had versus what numbers we're seeing today. And that's something I'm gonna be talking about in just a minute. 
Okay, one last question, because I know that you're probably going to answer a lot of these things, but this came from a couple of different people. Um, so Ellie was asking, you know, what species do we eat generally? And Ellen was also asking if you like to eat salmon. So I thought you might want to address, you know, if someone goes to this um, restaurant and there's Atlantic salmon on the menu, what does that mean? So that's a really good question. And that's something that um, I get asked quite frequently as well. When you go into a restaurant or a market or see it on any menu, that Atlantic salmon that you're seeing, um, if you're in the United States, is coming from a farm. So similar to um, farming for cattle or for chicken, uh, we farm Atlantic salmon as well. So any salmon on your plate, if you are in the United States, is coming from a farm and it's safe to eat. Um, I do eat Atlantic salmon. Um, however, the type of Atlantic salmon that we're talking about today is the type of Atlantic salmon that's found in the wild, so that spends its life in the rivers and oceans. So I know I said I was done with questions, but this comes from James, who I think you might know. And James is wondering uh, if that's a boy salmon. It is a boy salmon, and I do know James. If it's the James from uh, Salem, New York, um, it is a boy salmon. Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll, <laughs> let you. I'll let you continue on and save questions for later. Of uh, course. So let's get into what is an Atlantic salmon. So they have these really unique lifestyles. Uh, that big word, I hope you guys are all saying it with me, diadromous. Uh, you're not going to get quiz later, but I hope you do remember. So they spend half their lives in freshwater and half their lives in the ocean. They spawn, which means they lay eggs in freshwater. They'll spend a couple of years living in those freshwater environments. They will eventually leave the rivers of Maine. They'll swim all the way out to their spawning grounds in uh, off the coast of Greenland, spend a couple years there getting nice and fat off their favorite foods, and then they'll come all the way back to the same rivers that they were born to spawn again. And that is this really cool thing. It's called natal homing. So they will go thousands and thousands of miles on what we call a migration. Does anybody know what the word migration means? Great question. So what is migration is what Sarah is asking. Does anyone have an answer for that? Let me just see. Let's see. Rebecca says it's movement. And I'm also seeing that um, folks are saying going from one place to another. Oh, Lillian says it's going north. David thinks it's when an animal travels. Taylor says moving to another place. So I think those are a big movement of animals together, is what someone says. So I'll leave so you with those. Yeah, we, I mean, we've got really, really smart listeners today. Uh, those are all exactly right. Uh, it is a big, big journey for these animals to make. So a migration is going from one place to the other. In the case of Atlantic salmon, they will leave their rivers in Maine and they will swim all the way out to the Labrador Sea off the coast of Greenland, which can be about 2,000 to 3,000 miles. And for you guys at home, um, I don't know about you, I'm about five feet, a little over five feet. Uh, Atlantic salmon as adults can grow to be uh, around four feet, uh, four and a half feet, so a little bit smaller than I am. Um, this migration for me, if I walked out my front door where I am currently now in Boston, this would be like walking to Chicago and back. And that's just one part of the journey. So these fish are swimming miles and miles and miles to get to their feeding ground. Can you imagine if you had to go 4,000 miles round trip to just get lunch? It's a really, really long distance. So after they spend a couple of years out in the sea getting nice and fat on one of their favorite food sources, which is this really oily, dense capelin, the type of little fish, they'll swim all the way back to their rivers that they left from so that they can spawn. So after about that uh, two year return, they'll come all the way back. Uh, another really cool thing about Atlantic salmon is a lot of the salmon species on the Pacific coast. So there's uh, sockeye salmon, Chinook salmon. Um, we only have one type of salmon here on the East coast and that's the Atlantic salmon. So the majority of salmon that are out on the West coast there's something called a terminal breeder. So a terminal breeder is a salmon that will migrate back from the ocean, return to the rivers, and once they spawn, they actually die. Uh, the really cool thing about Atlantic salmon 
is they can spawn more than once in their lifetimes. So they'll come back to those rivers, they'll swim another 100 miles, 200 miles back into their rivers and streams to spawn. And then when it's time, those adult salmon will leave the rivers again and complete their migration. They'll go all the way back to the coast of Greenland um, for another winter out at sea, and they can come back and spawn more than once in their lifetime. So when we're talking about Atlantic salmon, we just learned about their really unique lifestyle. We learned that they spend half their time in freshwater, half their time in saltwater. They return to spawn after a couple of years, and when they spawn, every time a female spawns, she lays about 7,500 eggs per nest. But why are they endangered? What's happening? So imagine if each one of the fish that you see on your screen is actually a thousand fish. So historically, we used to see Atlantic salmon come back to the Penobscot River. So that's the river that my office is located on. We used to see runs of 75 to 100,000 salmon returning to our streams every year. 100,000, imagine if each one of those fish was actually a thousand, so 100,000 fish returning. This is how many we had returned last year. And this wasn't just the Penobscot, this is all rivers in Maine. So last year, we only had about 1,300 Atlantic salmon return to our rivers. Can any of you guys uh, guess or know what might have happened to some of our Atlantic salmon? How did we go from 100,000 to last year only seeing a little over 1,000? Okay, so the question for you all, I'm looking for your response, is how did we go from having those historically high numbers of Atlantic salmon and now um, we have so few? And so Ben thinks that maybe sharks have been eating them. Uh, David and um, Natalie think maybe overfishing. Taylor says predation. Uh, and... They get, Ellen says, you know, they either get hunted or eaten by predators. Ella thinks just in general animals are maybe eating them. Mabel thinks maybe it's pollution. And, yep, that seems there are a few other people chiming in, but I think they sort of follow all those themes of what I just shared with you, Sarah. So those were a lot of great answers. Uh, predation is definitely a big one. Um, but something else has happened over time. We have... Uh, this big geographical area that we talked about salmon covering. They live in rivers, they live in oceans, but something has happened over the last 100 to 200 years and it's actually impacted their river habitats. And that's been barriers or blocked rivers. So over time, uh, you know, we've built structures along rivers, we've built roads to be able to reach places um, you know, that were before unable for us to get to. So something like what you see on the left hand of your screen, that's called a dam. And then on the right hand of your screen, that is a culvert. So as you can imagine, if you're a fish swimming back after already swimming several thousand miles, and you're trying to get up river to spawn and you come across one of these barriers, what's gonna happen? You've swam all this way to spawn, and if you can't make it upstream and you're a fish, then you're not gonna spawn. And that means less numbers for the future populations. So our blocked rivers was a really um, big reason as to why we saw these Atlantic salmon populations start to decline. And this is uh, for you guys out there that like a little humor. Um, this is a striped bass, which we'll talk about in just a little bit, but you've swam all this way and now you can't get up uh, to make it to your end goal of trying to spawn. So. What does that look like? So here are three maps of Maine, that state that I uh, told you about living in. On the left-hand side, the one that has all those nice blue rivers, those are the historic reaches of our rivers here in Maine. On the far right-hand side, those tiny blue marks, those are the only rivers that are currently accessible for these salmon. And if you look that map smack dab in the middle with all those red dots, each one of those dots represents a dam. Right now in the state of Maine, there are over 600 dams in the river. So you can imagine if you were an Atlantic salmon and you had just spent several thousand miles traveling to get back to your natal rivers and you come back and you only have those small amount of rivers to get to, we really, you know, there's not a lot of habit that they, habitat that they still have access to. 
another one that I heard you guys all say is predators. So not just predators in the river, but they have predators in the ocean as well. So on the left-hand side, that's something called a cormorant. They are a very deep diving seabird that loves eating Atlantic salmon when they're about this big. Uh, they'll catch them coming out of the rivers and we'll talk about that in just a second. But they also have things like harbor seals, striped bass. Um, they're very tasty. People like to eat them and animals like to eat them. So pred predation and predators is another one of those threats. And then we have this big mystery of what's going on in the ocean. So one of the things I said they swam for is capelin. That's the fish in the top uh, left of your screen. They went from eating these really fatty, nutritious capelin uh, to eating less nutritious armhook squid. So that's kind of like going from eating a nice healthy bowl of salad to having a couple of pieces of candy for dinner instead. Um, so their diet changed, something changed the way that they eat. Um, and as you can see, predation in the ocean is a problem as well. And then there's this other big question mark with marine survival is there's something else happening and we're not quite sure what it is. Um, so they're facing barriers, uh, uh, predation in their rivers, predation in the ocean, and changes of what they're eating and what their diet is composed of. So we call this death by a thousand cuts. There's no one thing that's causing an Atlantic salmon to really be endangered. It's all of these things that are added to why Atlantic salmon are as, as are endangered as they are. So here's just a little video. So Atlantic salmon used to have this huge geographical range. They used to be found as far south as Long Island Sound in New York. And this is where they currently are found today. It's a big difference, right? So before I continue, does anybody have any questions? Thanks for stopping, Sarah, because we do have a few questions that came in. <clears throat> so um, someone was wondering, what's the difference? I guess they've heard of landlocked salmon, and they were wondering what the big difference is between landlocked salmon and Atlantic salmon. I don't know if that's something you're going to address or um, if you want to answer that quickly. Um, I wasn't going to address it, but I would love to uh, answer that now. So a landlocked salmon um, is, from a scientific perspective, uh, Salmo Salar is the scientific name. They're the exact scientific name. Um, but a landlocked salmon doesn't have any portion of its life in the ocean. So the salmon that we're talking about today are those diadromous Atlantic salmon that have part of their life cycle in the ocean and then part of their life cycle back in the rivers. <laughs> Great, I have a couple of other questions. Um, so Holly is asking, why did they stop eating capelin? Are there fewer capelin, and if so, why is that? Ooh, that is a really good question. Um, so over time in the marine environment, there has been a shift. So um, some of you guys may or may not uh, know the term climate change. There are experiencing warmer waters, and what we're thinking, and again, there are a lot of variables that, um, impact their habitat, and this is just one of them. Um, one of the thoughts might be that as the waters get warmer, the animals or the species that need colder water to survive will start migrating northward to stay in that region of colder water. So um, what might be happening is that the capelin might be migrating northward if there's colder waters there, and the Atlantic salmon, when they're coming back to the feeding ground, um, might not be in the same range anymore. Um, so that's just one of the examples that um, is something that they couldn't uh, or that we don't know if if that's the main cause as to why they're eating farther down on the food chain and that arm hook squid is now more accessible in the Labrador Sea. Um, but that is one of the pieces of research that our office is conducting when they go and do samples in Greenland, which I'll hit on in just a moment. So um, two more questions. One comes from Duncan and he's asking, um, why do we need so many dams? So maybe you can just, you know, highlight what dams are used for. Um, yeah, so dams historically have been used for a number of things. Um, in Maine, one of the big ones would be um, for the logging industry. People would build dams to be able to move logs more efficiently from these great reaches in Maine, um, all the way down to the coasts where a lot of building was occurring. Um, so that's one of them. Some dams are uh, still in use today for harnessing hydroelectric energy, so getting energy from the rivers. Um, other uh, barriers that aren't dams are something like a culvert that would just be allowed uh, 
for a car to pass over. Um, there's so many rivers in Maine. You, you remember that picture that was all the um, historical river network. Um, we started driving around on cars. We wanted to be able to go from one side or the other. So in order to be able to drive over those rivers and streams, we would put in a culvert that would pass water um, but might not necessarily pass fish. So that's one of the other things that um, is causing all those blockages in the river. Great. One last question before I move on, because I know you have really exciting stuff to share with us. This comes from Aoife and Colum, and I love asking this question of all of our presenters. What's the most interesting part of your job? I love the people that I work with, uh, but I also get to do really cool things. And I actually have a video of me doing one of my favorite things. So if you don't mind, I'm going to hold that question or I'm going to answer it in just a little bit. Absolutely, because I've seen that video. And let me tell you, Ephraim Colum, it's worth the wait. So when we get to it, I'm sure Sarah will, will uh, do a shout out to you. All right. Thanks so much. And carry on, Sarah. Um, so we now know Atlantic salmon are really endangered. So what does my office do? My office is really cool. We are, um, half of us are researchers and half of us are managers, which is just um, a lot of people all working together to figure out how to solve a problem. Um, so these are all those research efforts that our office is currently conducting. I'm not going to go into all of them today because we've got a lot of stuff to cover. Um, but the one that I am going to talk about is acoustic telemetry. So I have a little video that I'm going to uh, show for you guys. There is no volume associated with this video. I'm just going to be uh, narrating it to be able to um, move through it a little bit uh, easier, I guess. Um, so these are Atlantic salmon smolts. Uh, they're about five to seven inches. And um, this is when they're going to start that migration outside of their journey. So what we want to do is we want to be able to figure out when they're starting their migration, when they're leaving our rivers and streams, what's happening. So what we do is we go to a hatchery where we have these uh, Atlantic salmon smolts. We'll take a dip net in and in each one of those buckets, there is Atlantic salmon. And what we're going to do is we are going to implant a transmitter. Now, I don't know if you guys can see it this well, but here is the actual size of those transmitters, and that is next to a penny. So it's these really, really small transmitters that's going to help us conduct our research. So the surgery that you're about to see is putting one of these inside an Atlantic salmon smolt. So each smolt is going to be incredibly unique, and we want to make sure that we've got its weight measured, its length measured, and each salmon is going to have a separate barcode, kind of like if you've ever driven with your parents and you have an easy pass in your car, that pass that allows you to go through toll booths, um, that's unique to your car. This is very similar. Uh, so we make a little incision right here. Um, I know some of you guys might ask, they are anesthetized, which means they're uh, sleepy and they don't feel what's um, happening in the surgery. It's kind of like how we get our ears pierced. Um, so we're, uh, this is Graham Goulet, one of our uh, researchers. And he's taking a scalpel and he's making an incision so he can put that receiver right in the belly. Um, Jim Hawks, one of our other researchers, is making sure that that salmon is staying nice and um, because salmon are fish, they do um, get their oxygen from water. So as you can see, Jim is periodically making sure that that uh, fish is getting oxygenated water to make sure that he's going to stay healthy and fine. And then once he's done, he goes back in the bucket. So that is how we move from one slide to the next. Let me just. So now that we have all of our fish with all of those transmitters sewn up in their bellies, what do we do? How do we collect data using that information? So if you look on the left, we have a cement block with one of our receivers on it. I also have one of our receivers as well. So what we'll do is now we've got to put these receivers out into the river. So it's not just enough to just have the transmitter. The transmitter needs something to talk to, kind of like um, if you just have one cell phone, you can't call yourself. You need a second cell phone to be able to make sure those two items are talking. So if you look on the map on the right, every one of those dots, let me get a pointer going here. Each one of those dots represents one of these receivers. So as you can see up in Bangor, the river is fairly narrow. We only need one receiver in those areas. But the farther down we go, um, as you can see, it kind of looks like a smudge of dots. What we're doing is we're making sure we're dropping enough receivers so that they overlap. The point is, is we want to make sure that we know where this fish is at all times when it's in the river. 
So we need to make sure that, again, just like cell phones, that we have all of our bases covered. We want to make sure that we've got lapping receivers so that we don't miss where this fish is at any given time. So how this works is once our receivers are in the river, we'll then release the fish up here in Bangor. So as the fish starts swimming close to any one of these receivers, the transmitter in its belly will start talking to the receiver that's underwater in the bottom of the river, and it will start pinging. So as it gets closer, it will be pinging and pinging and pinging and pinging, and as it's pinging, it's collecting information. So we're gonna know exactly where this fish was, what time of day he was there, how quickly he moved from one receiver to the other, and by the very end of it, um, once we've got our salmon that's in the river, he'll be pinging and pinging and pinging and we'll be able to collect the data and we'll be able to tell how long it took the salmon from the time we put him in the stream to the time he leaves. So generally that can be around five to eight days uh, for the salmon to be moving. And what we'd expect him to see is just a nice gentle wade down the river, pinging at all of the receivers. And then once he leaves one of these last arrays, he'll then begin his migration all the way up off the coast of Greenland. Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes we don't see that. Um, sometimes we might see an Atlantic salmon, he's pinging here, he's pinging here, he's pinging here, and then all of a sudden he starts pinging back up and pinging down, and he's pinging up and down, up and down, up and down. Does anybody have an idea as to why we might see something like that? That is a great question, Sarah. All right, so I'm looking for people to uh, give me some ideas. Oh, I see one. I'm going to wait on your answer, Duncan, because I think you've got it and see if some other people uh, weigh in as well. But do we have any ideas why a fish that is pinging and pretty low down in the river that's made it, it down might be going back and forth, back and forth? So Ellie thinks maybe uh, the fish is dodging rocks. Uh, David thinks maybe there are predators. I'm just. Uh, uh, Ronald thinks maybe it has to do with the salinity. Ella thinks maybe he's confused. Rebecca thinks maybe he's looking for food. And I'm going to go back to Duncan. Duncan thinks maybe the fish was eaten. Hey, maybe the fish was eaten. So that is exactly right. But it wasn't just eaten by anything. That fish had to have eaten something that's still going to be in the rivers, right? Or else he wouldn't be pinging on our receivers. So something like a striped bass loves eating these guys. So as that striped bass eats our salmon smolt, it still has its transmitter. The transmitter and the receiver are still talking, but this time because striped bass are um, big fish that like moving in and out of the estuary. So I know somebody said they might be moving with the salt water. These salmon, uh, or these, pardon, these striped bass move up and down in this part of the river to try to find prey. So it's in that belly of that striped bass that transmitter is still doing its job, that receiver is still doing its job, but that salmon is not migrating. So only about three out of every 10 Atlantic salmon smolts will actually be successful and make it out of the rivers into the ocean. Um, so I have one more for you guys. So what if we saw an Atlantic salmon and he's pinging and he's pinging at these receivers, and then all of a sudden, two start pinging together back up the river. So we saw two pinging up the river. Do you think that's two salmon that are swimming fin and fin together back up the river? So that's a good question. I love that data point that you're talking about there, Sarah. So, so Sarah's question is we have two transmitters that are now traveling together. They seem to be synced up. Are they traveling fin and fin? Ellie thinks maybe, and Juan both think that maybe they can be mating. Ellen and Rebecca say no. And Natalie, Natalie, I'm, uh, Natalie and Ella, I'm holding off for a second, but you've got it. I'm going to just see if we get a few more guesses. What do you think happened? And David, I'm holding off on you. They um, they don't, uh, most people are saying, no, they're not traveling fin and fin, but all of the folks and Taylor that I just mentioned said that maybe the same predator ate them both and they're traveling in the same belly. That is exactly right. So I know Natalie, Ella, I think uh, one other person or a couple of you guys might have gotten it, but that's exactly right. Now there's two predators in one belly because this might not be uh, enough lunch for just one animal. Um, so things like the cormorants, the seabirds, they might be eating those and they might be flying all the way up and start pinging at one of those receivers that are upstream. 
So this uh, science and this data, this can tell us a lot about how the Atlantic salmon is moving and where it's moving, what time of day, and also what's happening. So what did we just learn? We learned that Atlantic salmon have predators when they're leaving. Only about three out of 10 are making it down those rivers. Um, this kind of science and this kind of research also talks about, are they moving around barriers? Are they starting to swim and then realizing there is a dam that they can't get around and then they're stuck there for a couple of days or an undersized culvert that they can't pass through? Um, so this is just a fraction of the research uh, that my office is currently doing to try to figure out what's going on with Atlantic salmon. Um, the same thing's happening in the ocean. Remember that earlier puzzle that we talked about with um, what's going on in the ocean, that it could be a, a food source um, or it could be uh, predation. Uh, so we're conducting science in the ocean as well because every little bit of information that we're conducting helps us solve the greater puzzle about what's happening to Atlantic salmon. But before I continue, does anybody have any questions? Yes, sorry, I uh, was getting a, um, a couple of questions. So <clears throat> we have a question from David. And David, I, I can't remember if you're going to get to this, Sarah, you can feel free to delay this question. But why do you think the smelt, are the smelt that are raised in captivity and then released from the hatchery, are they behaving simil similarly to wild salmon? And why do you think that is? So that's a really good question. Um, so the smolts that we place into the river, um, with our research, we can tell that they're going to start migrating out to the ocean. Um, that's what's in their nature. What um, we've seen with our research, when we put them in, we can track those smolts and we know that that's their normal behavioral pattern. When a, a smolt goes through a certain process called smoltification, um, so when they're uh, small and they live in the rivers, they've got um, this darker pattern and they blend in well with the rocks in their environment. Um, but when it's time for them to start that migration, they turn this beautiful silver color. Um, you might have seen it in one of the pictures of the videos. Um, so that's something that happens in nature and is happening in our fish. And that's how we know they're ready to go out into the rivers and begin that migration. So they do have um, some of that uh, natural um, inclination to, to do that migration. Um, and then several years later, because we do mark these fish, we uh, actually recapture them as adults. So we can say, we released this fish, we released this fish on this date, and now it's back to our rivers and it's an adult so that it was um, successful in its migration and its maturation or it's growing to uh, be an adult. Great, thank you. Just a couple more questions. Um, someone asked, do you study other types of fish too or just focus on Atlantic salmon? So Atlantic salmon is uh, the main one that we focus on because we are in protected resources. So we work with endangered species like the Atlantic salmon. Um, other fish such as uh, sturgeon, so we have an endangered sturgeon and a threatened sturgeon in our rivers as well that um, we work with the local university on research. Um, but a lot of what we're doing with Atlantic salmon and restoration efforts, which I'll talk about in just a moment, actually help the other sea run fish communities that are in our rivers. So we don't work, uh, we might not work directly with them, but what we're doing does have an impact on the other fish that are in the river. Um, in terms of how we're choosing to help restore these Atlantic salmon species. Awesome. Last question, because a couple of people asked this, what do the Atlantic salmon eat? And I think that question, since you've been talking so much about the river, is what are they eating on their way down the river? We've talked a lot about them being food for other things, but what are they filling their bellies with? So that's really interesting. Um, once Atlantic salmon start migrating out the rivers, they stop eating. And it's the same thing that we see with adults as well. Uh, so adults go all the way out to Greenland to get this really high nutritious capelin, this um, food that gives them a lot of energy, right? Because food gives us energy. So they're making sure that they're giving themselves as much energy as possible because as those adults return, once they start swimming upstream, they stop eating. So whatever they have in their tanks, it's exactly like a, a car in a gas tank. Um, they're full up with fuel and they have all that journey, they're not gonna be filling up again um, until they leave again to start their migration again. So um, in the ocean when they're uh, eating it's those capelin, um, in the rivers when they're starting to grow, it's um, a lot of um, insects and bugs. Um, but yeah, during that migration, they're not eating. It's kind of, Kind of neat, that was a really good question. 
Great. And I, um, I'm just curious if you know the answer to this. Is the Atlantic salmon the rarest fish on the East Coast? Because I'm not sure I know the answer to that. So that's why I'm, if you don't know the answer to that, that might be a good challenge question for folks to look up. So feel free to challenge our listeners to look that up. I am going to challenge you guys. I, I do know that there are other endangered species like the sturgeon that we just talked about, but I'm not sure in terms of population numbers. Um, and that's only in my small neck of the woods. So one of the things that I also challenge you guys to do, I heard some of you guys were from Colorado, from Mississippi, um, from New York. You might not have Atlantic salmon because they're only in Maine. I also challenge you guys to, after this is over, and hopefully if you guys tune back in on Wednesday, uh, figure out what endangered species are in your neck of the woods. So that's my challenge to you guys. Excellent. So I have a few other questions, but I'm going to save them till the end. So carry on, Sarah. Thanks. So what have we done? We had a question, right? We had that question of why are Atlantic salmon endangered? What's going on? How can, you know, how can this be? How can they go from 100,000 to 1,000? And then we conducted our research. Um, so we did the telemetry. We sewed the transmitter in the belly of the fish to figure out what was happening, what was going on. And we found that they were getting eaten. We found that they weren't able to migrate back into their rivers to spawn. So what do we do now? Uh, we come up with creative solutions. So I'm asking you guys, what is the solution to some of our problems? Say, if you're a fish and you are just coming back from a 2,000, 3,000 mile migration and you hit one of those dams, one of those barriers, what is a way that we can pass fish around a dam or around a barrier? Okay, that is a really great question. Okay, so what Sarah's looking for right now is we've said that this, the dams can be an obstruction to the salmon being able to get up and down the river. So what are some things that we might be able to do to help the fish get around those barriers? And Rebecca says um, a fish ladder, which if you don't know what a fish ladder is, I know Sarah's going to tell us. Taylor says maybe have a little opening in the bottom for them to cross um, through. And Lillian says secret passages. I like the idea of a secret passage. Uh, David said maybe you can use a bridge-like structure. Ethan Cullum, maybe a tunnel under the dam. Um, oh, James says maybe you can just catch the fish and move them. Duncan suggests that we make fish tunnels. So Lawrence says maybe we just remove the dam entirely. Or Ellie says maybe you can create a separate mini river for the fish to migrate on. I gotta say, I love the fact that so many folks came up with our with the solutions I know you're gonna talk about. So well done. You even came up with some that I don't usually hear people come up with. So that's a good list. I'll let you go from there, Sarah. You guys are brilliant. You guys can do my job for me because you guys hit them all on the head. So the first one I heard. So, Sarah, we can't hear you. I'm not sure if your volume went out. Can't hear you right now. So if you look at your, maybe your volume button got pushed on the, on the left. Nope. Hmm. Let's see. We've not had this happen before. Maybe go to your previous slide. Let me just see if you're muted, maybe. Nope. I'm not sure what just happened. Can people hear me? Can everybody hear me on the presentation? Yes, okay, you can. All right, so Sarah, try talking again. There, oh, you came in for a second. You're coming in and out, so maybe it's something to do with your Wi-Fi. I'm sure it probably is. Oh, now you're back. You're back. All right, keep going. There you are. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Great. Perfect. Um, so fish ladders, you guys said it right off the bat. Um, somebody, I think Natalie it might have been, this is the first time I've ever heard somebody guess that. You are brilliant. These were great ideas. Uh, a nature-like bypass, so that's like building a river around it. So if you look at this picture right here, let me get my pointer tool. So right here, the dam is still in place, 
Um, but what we've done is we've carved this river right around the dam. So that's this picture here on the left. Um, we have scientists, researchers, managers, and engineers that crafted this so that each rock was placed perfectly to allow fish like the Atlantic salmon to move around that. Another one we have, and I didn't, I didn't hear this one, um, but it is one of my favorites, is a fish elevator or a fish lift. So if uh, we're working with a hydroelectric dam, which is one of those ones that generates electricity, we can't always remove it or we can't put a fish around it because they require that water to come in to spin the turbines to generate electricity. So they may build something like a fish lift. So what happens is the fish swims up to the gate, the gate's open, the fish swims in and the gate's closed. And then that gate will actually lift the fish up and around the dam. And then um, sometimes they get collected if we need to do any samples. Um, if not, they get released on the other side. So the one that you see on the picture on the right isn't the exact one, um, but we have one that's very similar that just got put in a couple years ago on the Penobscot River um, on the Milford Dam, it's the Milford Fish Lift. Can anybody guess how much something like this might cost? How much could a fish lift cost, a fish elevator cost? Good question. So I love this question because people usually ask us how much things cost and now we're turning it back on you. Riley thinks it's 2 million. Ellie thinks 25,000. Aiden, I think that's 300,000. Rebecca just says it probably costs a lot. Uh, oh, this is like the price is right. Uh, Duncan says 15,000. Aoife and Cullum say 9,000. Um, 3 million, 20 million, 1 million. So you've got some good guesses there, Sarah. Got some really good guesses. And some of you guys are really close. I think Rebecca said, man, that must cost a lot. Uh, the one that was put in a couple of years back on the Milford Dam cost just over $18 million. So that's a big price tag to get fish around these um, impediments or these blockages in the river. But remember, they're not always dams. Sometimes it's those small undersized culverts. So if you take a look, um, uh, the picture on the left, those dark moving uh, blobs that you see on your screen, those are alewives. Um, so it's one of the other sea run fish. And as you can tell, they're stuck because they can't pass through here. So what's something that uh, we can do? We've got these great partners that help replace these undersized culverts with these beautiful expansion bridges. And we actually um, work with a group called Project Share. And here's one of my favorite videos that uh, is a nice time lapse of a project they did two years ago. And this just shows you um, what they do and what goes into replacing these undersized culverts. Um, so I know we might have some construction fanatics out there, but um, by the end of the day, it goes from that undersized culvert to this beautiful expansion bridge that if you're an Atlantic salmon, it's much easier to swim underneath something like that um, than to try to jump into a small culvert or be surrounded by a metal tube. Um, so that's another great option. And then I know somebody else said this as well. If there is the option to do a total dam removal, why not try it? So this is a picture of Cooper's Mills Dam on the Sheepscot River in Maine. This is the picture of it, how it looked in 2017. And here is how it looks today. So this is a total dam removal. Um, maybe less snow on the ground, or we hope now that it's April. Um, but as you can tell, it opens up the river completely for fish to pass through. So we just talked about all these really great ways to make sure that we can work with um, fish, the environment, and these rivers to try to reconnect our rivers and streams. But that's not all we do. Um, some parts of our program include stocking fish. Uh, so what we'll do in the middle of the winter is we will take some of those salmon eggs from the hatcheries. We will ride on snowmobiles to really remote uh, reaches in our state in Maine. And we will actually plant salmon eggs in the gravel. So somebody asked you, uh, somebody asked earlier what my favorite thing to do is. Um, well, this is one of them. It can't beat a nice day getting out on a snowmobile, helping make sure that we are um, putting salmon eggs into the rivers so that hopefully those eggs can hatch, they can grow after a couple of years, they can become smolts, and then we can follow them out the river and hopefully in a couple of years time, they will come back to the rivers and spawn to try to help make that population a little bit bigger. So all of this stuff that we talked about, Everything that we've talked about today, is this helping salmon? Is the work that we're doing helping restore Atlantic salmon? Um, since the initial listing of salmon on the endangered species list in 2000, and then again in 2009, so it's kind of been about 20 years of this, we've removed over, and by saying we, 
it's by no means just NOAA. It's uh, NOAA, Fish and Wildlife Service, all of our local tribes, uh, our state department, uh, Department of Marine Resources. It's our NGO communities. They all help. We've been able to help remove over 25 dams. Uh, hundreds of culverts have been removed and replaced. Over 15 fishways constructed. Um, and hundreds of miles of salmon habitat that wasn't accessible before all this is now accessible. So what are we seeing? Um, on your screen is river herring. Atlantic salmon are a little slow to respond to restoration efforts just because of that really unique life cycle. But what we're seeing is we're seeing river herring come back. Um, if you guys hang on to this call or this um, webinar on Friday, I believe that um, somebody's gonna be talking about river herring. So uh, that's definitely one to catch. But we had, um, in river hearing on the Penobscot in 2012-2013, we had about 2,000 river hearing return. Uh, last year, we had 2 million river hearing returns. We had two dams that were removed, and with two dams removed, we saw river hearing increase by 2 million. So we are finding that a lot of the things that we're doing have these added benefits on what's happening with the rivers and opening up the rivers. It's really helping a lot of other different animals in the rivers. So before we go on, I have a question for you guys. What do you guys think that you guys could do to help salmon or sea run fish or any other endangered species that might be in your own backyard? What's something that we could do to help? Okay, so the question Sarah's looking for answers to is what's something that you personally can do that might either help Atlantic salmon or endangered species um, near you? And Rebecca, you have hit the nail on the head with your answer. And one of the most important things you can do is spread the word. That's what Rebecca says that she thinks um, she can do. Anything else? Um, Wesley says, you know, don't litter, another really great solution. So making sure you're um, not contributing to the pollution problem. Um, Aoife and Cullum say you could raise money for that very expensive fish elevator. Um, Ellie says, observe our natural waterways and maybe report any blockages or problems. Ella says recycling. Um, William says somewhere that's maybe completely dammed and, and doesn't have fish, maybe you can, can help restore that area with hatchery fish or with um, wild fish from somewhere nearby. Lillian says, you know, maybe go out and help with building fish passages. Um, Aiden says voting can make a big difference. Um, Taylor has a great idea. Talk to people of authority and doing a citywide um, dam either removal or modification for the fish. So those are some of our answers. Gosh, so those are really good answers. Um, and some of them I didn't even capture. Some of you guys said voting or um, talk to your town. Let your town know that uh, reconnecting rivers is important to you. That's a really great one. Um, you guys uh, said sharing knowledge as well. Take what you've learned, um, share it with anybody that you might talk to uh, sitting at the dinner table or messaging your friends. Um, sharing knowledge, like, did you even know Atlantic salmon was endangered? I didn't. I see them on restaurants all the time. Well, here's why. Um, we also have um, some other resources that are going to be posted where this um, webinar is going to be posted as well. So Agents of Discovery is a mobile app. Um, so if you guys are interested and in, you're really uh, now going to be Atlantic salmon experts, so you guys will have no problem answering these questions. But um, the hyperlink that will be where these uh, webinars are. You can go print out and download an app on your phone, and it's a free app, and you can um, do a mission to learn more about Atlantic salmon. Um, two days from now is also Earth Day. So Earth Day is a great day to go outside and pick up trash. And you're, uh, again, remember we are social distancing. So if you have um, a place that you can clean up a local river system, streams, uh, walk on the beach and collect garbage is another one. Um, and those of you guys that might not have those accesses to cleaning up environments, uh, you can still, uh, from the love of your uh, couch, you can submit an endangered species picture to our endangered species art contest. So the deadline is not until Friday, so you still have a couple of days for that as well. Um, there's a lot of things that you can do, but the biggest one is talk and learn more. Uh, you guys all just are now junior scientists and know exactly how to save Atlantic salmon. And with that being said, does anybody have any questions? And just remember, uh, during these times, we wanna remind you to stay at least three Atlantic salmon spaces between you and others. Thank you guys so much for joining. Awesome, Sarah. I have just a few questions for you before we let you go. 
Um, one, Celeste had a great question, and I just thought you might want to share this with the group. Why you insert a transmitter rather than just putting a tag on the fish? Ooh, that's a really good question. So we actually, I have, while well, I reach off screen, I don't know if you guys can see it this well. These are all the different types of tags. So I just talked about one. Um, the one that we were talking about was a transmitter. So the difference between, I think what Celeste might be asking is like how you might just clip a fin if you're tagging a shark or tagging a turtle. Um, and that would allow you to, um, if you recapture it, you can figure out how long, um, where it's gone from point A to point B. So that only gives you a certain amount of information. But by using one of these, uh, the transmitters, and by using the receiver, we're actually able to collect a little bit more information than just um, a tagging would do. It allows us to tell us um, the time of day that they're moving, how long it's taking them to get from one place to another. Um, so it's just a way for us to get as much information as possible um, instead of just tagging the fish. It's a really good question. Right, and just to reiterate what Sarah said, if you were to just put a tag, you'd have to recapture. And so with this method that she's talking about, you don't have to recapture the fish, which is a really, um, would be a real challenge to, to recapture. And then another question that I had for you from William, which is a great question, is for someone who maybe is interested in working for NOAA or the Division of Marine Fisheries or U.S. Fish and Wildlife um, in Maine, you know, what would your advice be like in terms of education and, and what's the sort of entry level position that, that folks might be able to sort of look for if, if they're interested in doing this amazing work that you do? That's a really good question. Um, so the first is um, look for organizations in your area that might be um, a nonprofit organization that uh, is doing work like this. So um, the Nature Conservancy, which is, uh, we have the Nature Conservancy in Maine, but I know the Nature Conservancy is throughout the United States. Um, volunteering is always a great way to get your foot in the door. Um, we also have, once you get to college, we have a lot of internship opportunities. So we get about three to four internships through our office every summer. Um, so internships and getting hands-on experience is always a great way to go about it. Um, and then uh, another great way is to be a contractor. So once you do graduate college, if you're still looking for um, that line of work, contract positions are a great way. And it's uh, work that supports the work the federal government is doing. Um, so there's a lot of great ways, volunteering uh, with local organizations, applying for internships, um, and then uh, lots of different uh, creative ways. I actually started off as a researcher before I uh, went into outreach and um, education, I was doing a lot of different research. So um, it was another thing to just uh, be able to find the opportunities that I was really interested in and um, go from there. It's a really good question, William. Great. So I do, there are some more questions, but unfortunately we are really out of time. So I just want to end this by saying, will, um, Sarah, Thank you so much. It was really exciting to hear about your work. It was really great to learn so much about Atlantic salmon, things we can do. I encourage you, like Sarah said, to go to the NOAA Live website. We do have that link up for um, down for information about the app and how you can set that up in your house, which is a great activity that you can still do while you're keeping your social distance, as well as applying all of the knowledge that you just learned from Sarah. I want to encourage you to come to our webinar on Wednesday. I hope you're as excited as I am because we're going to learn all about space weather. And you might not know what that is. Join me because I also don't know what that is. And I'm looking forward to learning so much from our speaker. He comes to us from Boulder, Colorado, and will be telling us about the work they do there about um, space weather and how we can learn how to predict what's going to happen. So please join us 11 o'clock, same place, same time on Wednesday. And again, in the um, in your house, please give Sarah a round of applause. She did such a great job. Great questions, everyone. And we will see you on Wednesday. So thanks so much and see you in a couple days. Bye.